Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're after deer with a cat. We're in a barn with Team Wild TV looking for feral pigeons. First, we've got a problem with urban foxes. It's late afternoon in a garden in South London and there's a little experiment being carried out. The hypothesis under test is urban foxes are bold enough to take a baby-sized object out of its pram and the sound of a baby crying is so similar to a fox's natural prey it makes the dummy baby even more attractive. The gentleman who filmed these events is a professional pest controller and Field Sports Channel viewer. He's seen the urban fox evolve into an opportunist and just wants to see how conditioned they've become. Yes, the piglet will smell, although it was frozen. However, the buggy is covered in human scent and the baby grow is brand new. The cry of the baby is a fascinating addition to this experiment. Here is a rabbit distress call used by fox shooters all over the world to call in their quarry. Doesn't sound that different to a baby, does it? Robert Bucknell, a foxing expert interviewed for our Foxing DVD, says how closely these sounds resemble each other. You might have loads of foxes that aren't going to be a problem, but there's always one or two that will push the boundaries back and um, hear something wailing like a hare in distress and it goes and has a look and finds a nice piece of protein there, it might have a nibble on it and, and therein lies the problem. There's always people getting bitten or you know that sort of thing but it's, it's pretty rare but of course it's now become more newsworthy and we're going to see it in the papers a little more. We are releasing this film not to demonise foxes, just show that they're not pets and organisations like the BBC should know better. Here is last month's edition of their Wildlife magazine and their step-by-step -step guide to attracting foxes into your garden. Please don't have nightmares, but make sure your pet rabbits and guinea pigs are locked up every night. Urban foxes making news there. Also making news, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. <laughs> This is Field Sports Britain News. A new study suggests that dogs have been man's best friend for at least 30,000 years. A pair of dog skulls uncovered in digs in Siberia and Belgium have been aged at 33,000 years old. It shows dogs were domesticated long before any other animal, including sheep, cows or goats. The skulls had shorter snouts and wider jaws than wild animals such as wolves. It suggests dogs were used for companionship and protection. Two men have been injured in shooting accidents during game shoots in North Yorkshire, prompting police to issue a gun safety warning. One was struck in the face by pellets during a pheasant shoot in Strensall near York. A day later, another was hit in the leg on farmland near Selby. Both men suffered only minor injuries. Police said accidents were rare, but warned shooters to keep safety in mind. North Yorkshire police said it had seized the guns involved, while officers investigated the exact circumstances of the incidents. And finally, in the week that a bluefin tuna was sold at auction in Japan for just under half a million pounds, hunting fears that this animal is getting rarer, a US angler has caught what might be a world record yellowfin tuna, the bluefin's smaller cousin. It's a 90 by 62 inch yellowfin estimated at 432.4 pounds. The current 405 pound IGFA world record was 85.5 by 61 inches. You're up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Weather looks better there than here. Now, Roy Lupton's out stalking fallow does, he's calling in foxes in daylight, and he even has a problem with a dog walker. In Field Sports Channel Towers, Roy is known as the postman. He always delivers. This morning he hasn't got a little red van, but a six-wheel beast which has been defying physics in the highlands of Scotland as he hunts blue hares with his eagles. He's on his round on his ground in Sussex. He has a little flash around for some foxes, but the first stop is going to be fallow does. No, I've not, uh, I've not done any uh, doe culling for quite a while, so uh, I 
five feet away up in Scotland flying the birds. So we've uh, really got to get cracked on with the doe car because it's uh, getting on in the season. So uh, we need to, oh, well, hopefully we'll catch up with a few this morning. We've got Dom out with us, so uh, we've got uh, the second gun. So what we're going to do is we'll try and uh, position Dom in some of the places as we stalk through. So if any deer break, then uh, Dom's got to, or well, Dom should have a chance, hopefully for a shot or two, as they come through from the spinnies. So fingers crossed we'll give it a go. Although he's on parkland, the fences are no more and the herds here are transient. He'd like to take out about five of the local population. The only problem that we've got this morning is where we're going into um, is a bit that you is very, very difficult to, to get into by foot. You've actually got to cross a stream, so the extraction of the deer, if we do get one, is, uh, is always the problem. So that's why we bought the, the Argo this morning. So uh, if, we, uh, if we do get a few, then uh, hopefully we've got a, a means of getting them out. Dom is here as well, which could be interesting. If Roy is the postman, Dom is postman Pat. You're going to be filming with Roy, so we're going to find out which of us is the jinx. Um, it'd be an interesting scientific experiment to find out whether you're the reason or I'm the reason that we never get anything. My money's on you. Roy has a good idea where the deer will be and positions Dom to cover the exit point if we spook them. As hoped, the deer are in a spinny across the bridge, but they don't hang about. We crawl across the broken bridge, Roy lighting the way with his cheeks. The plan has worked in reverse and Dom has pushed two does our way. Roy shoots and for a change, the young doe runs. The group we initially spotted takes flight. Time to do some field work and follow the blood trail. You normally find a good constant trail, so where we are here, uh, we've got a, we had a, a fantastic outshot, um, a lot of blood where she stood for a while and then she's run, but on fallow you can lose the, uh, the blood quite easily. Um, as they move around, the muscle can cover up the, uh, the exit wound. Um, and then you can lose the, the blood um, as it pulls into their chest cavity. But she's, uh, as I say, she's not uh, not going to be far. We find the doe under a fallen branch. So she's just laying down there. So you can see if we hadn't followed the blood, um, we would have really struggled to find her. So uh, especially the way she's laid, if they've, if they've laid and the, their white underbelly is showing towards you, same as when you're rabbit shooting of a night, they're easy to find, but if they're laid the other way from you, like she is there, just tucked in, it's incredibly difficult to see them sometimes. There we go. Absolutely nothing wrong with the, the shot there. Um, it's obviously just where her, her adrenaline was up, um, where she'd uh, been spooked by Dom and came onto the bank there. Um, and uh, she just had enough to, uh, to stand there and then she uh, totted away down here. I mean, she's not more than 50 yards, but when you've got uh, cover like the bracken and the fallen trees, it can be very, very difficult to find them. They can be under your nose and you still not see them. So again, it's always a good idea if you have got one, have a, a dog with you, um, even with perfect shots, because you can, or it can take you a long time to find the carcasses um, in conditions like this if you haven't got a backup. Dom joins us and looks a bit sheepish. Humble tie anyone? I don't want to talk about it. Dom takes the strain and gets to grips with the young doe. Roy is keen for another, so we head off to a different part of the estate. We spot deer immediately, but they're not on our ground. Another 50 yards and for a change, the deer come to us. The camera remains standing, but Roy and Dom hit the deck. Three animals are just yards away in what appears to be a great shooting position, but all the boys can see are rear ends. We follow up slowly and still they remain tricky to nail down. Then they evaporate and we soon find out why. A dog walker in woodland with no footpaths. Hello. Hi there. Could you please refrain from walking your dogs through here, please? There's not a footpath here. 
And it's very dangerous because there's a lot of stalking activity goes on in here. Sorry? You know, this isn't a footpath here at all. So uh, it's, it's incredibly dangerous to walk through these parts of the woods because there is a lot of shooting going on. Roy is firm but fair. The other thing is, can you keep the dogs on leads? Um, because we've had a lot of deer killed with dogs. I know, but what they do is they run them against fences and then kill them against the fences. Uh, even just stressing them out because they're pregnant now as well, so if they get chased around a lot, it will uh, it damages them. Okay. Although she said that her dog wouldn't kill deer, uh, that dog was perfectly capable of chasing the deer, running them up against the fences and causing damage. Obviously, as the season progresses, uh, the does are pregnant at the moment. Um, you know, another another month or two, they're going to be very heavily pregnant, and if they start to get chased around like that, then it, it's going to cause a lot of damage to the uh, the future generations of deer that we've got on here. So, um, you know, you, you feel like you're bashing your head against a brick wall sometimes, but you know, you've always got to just try and put your point across and uh, and hope that eventually it sinks in. With our stalk spoiled, it's such a glorious morning, Roy feels it's just right for a squeak. He lets rip with the silver fox. <whistles> Bang! We have a very close observer. Dom takes his chance. I heard you whispering the other side of the tree, obviously. That, that was blocking my uh, my view. Uh, and then when he ran in, he, he stopped, obviously, Roy, trying to get him to stop on the call. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot closer than I was expecting. That fox just appeared to my right-hand side here, so he just came up behind us. Um, and made us. I didn't want to move um, until we got the camera on it and I was hoping if he did make us he'd just move off and then we'd get a chance to, to squeeze the trigger. Um, and uh, Dom did a super job as the fox just crossed our line back down the bottom here. Um, I was trying to stop him but he was just, uh, just moseying through. He'd slowed down a little bit. Um, but as this one appeared and the shot went off there was another fox coming up from the bottom um, just making its way through all the thick bramble there. So uh, obviously with the uh, with that report going off, it's, uh, it's unlikely he would have come anyway, but uh, no, really pleased. That was a, a fantastic call. He came in really close on that one. So uh, no, I hope it looks good. Time to recover that deer with the Argo. To increase the stakes, it's going to be a waterborne extraction. I've got to do my bungs up so we can go across, get back across the river. Why do we want there's a bridge, Roy? Shut up. <laughs> that look That's good, one bro. for the Christmas oh, blooper nice reel. <laughs> a successful and eventful morning, and even though there are bridges everywhere, Roy and Dom seem to be making the most of it. If you'd like to find out more about the Argocat, go to www.argocat.com. From deer to doves where Nottinghamshire farmers have a problem with feral pigeons pinching all their feed, they call in Team Wild TV. Whether stalking antelope in the African plains, foxes in the field of southern England, or this, feral pigeons in a farmer's barn in Staffordshire, you have to approach your quarry carefully and with plenty of forethought. So this is a perfect environment for feral pigeons. Uh, there's a grain store, there's plenty of uh, feed in here. The rafters are, provide great places to roost. You can see by the floor there's plenty of scat. These guys obviously live in here full time. Just going to make our way around the barn, just nice and steady, using all of these bags and this machinery as cover, uh, using these nice range finding binos, because uh, it is a big shed. We do need to make sure that we're checking our ranges. Uh, the rifle zeroed for 15 yards and 35 yards. This probably shoots about an inch high um, at 20. But any further than that, 40, 50 yard shots, it's a couple of inches difference and we don't want to be causing any damage to the asbestos or to the wooden framework here. So we're going to make our way around and, and see, what, see what we can find. You see those two up there on the rafter, on the beam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to take the one on the left. You're going to take the one on the right. Okay. On three. Is that one, two, three? Oh, one, two, three, one. On three. One, two, three. Got it. Okay. You 
ready? Yep. One, two, three. This is a livestock feed protection exercise. Once we've planned our approach, the shooting can begin. There's two more up there. Reload. I'll take the left, you take the right. One, two. Good shot, mate. Well done. so far. These guys, these pigeons haven't been shot for a while. Now look, the good thing is these air rifles, these day state air ranges are very quiet. Mine's got a silencer on with a carbine barrel and Keith has just got a shroud, shrouded barrel. So we've taken a few shots, we've missed a couple but they don't seem overly concerned. They're flying out, just flying around a couple of times and coming back in. So if we just hold fire for a little bit we should get a few more shots. So, pretty good day so far, i say it in a bag. So what we're gonna do now, I think we've pretty much uh, shot this out. Why don't we head back and uh, back to Fonty's place and we'll see what we can do in the yeah, sheds. So you can get some more up there. Let's do it. You need the farmer on your side and you need the farmer to know that you're on his side. The reason we've called you in is because of the pigeons are destroying the crops, causing messes in the barns, and which slows up the growth stages. And so you boys have come in to control the numbers so we're not going to have this damage in future. What sort of mess do they cause in the, in the barns? The sheds uh, have caused uh, muck and everything over the machinery which burns the paint and that sort of thing. We also get, keep them out of the crop stores which are food stores and if they'll get in through any available gap and they also cause uh, they're, uh, des defecating within the food stores which you don't want. Back at the shooting, and the ferals are still providing plenty of challenges. Another pigeon's just flown into the barn over here, and um, Keith hasn't had a brilliant day shooting. It's not up to his usual high standard, so a little bit of an argument as to who should take the shot, because I like to make sure the bird goes in the bag. But, you know, Killer's pretty keen, pretty confident he can get it, so it's down to you now, Killer. So, Keith, what do you have to say? Watch and learn. There's actually two birds in here, so what we're going to do is on three, we're going to see how Bonnie trots. Mr H1, Mr Killer, zero. For the record, that was Ian shooting. Bring it up, come on, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. So look at the mastery, man over beast. Come on, you. Here. Here. Bring on. Bring on. Good 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 on. As you can see, uh, Keith is a highly trained gun dog handler. Um, he's still trying to get that bird from that soft uh, mouth spaniel over there. But this is not unusual if you experience uh, seeing Keith operate in the field. This is pretty much powerful, of course. Um, we can faintly hear the sound of Benny Hill's theme tune in the background playing. Uh, it's not going to get any better. We might get that bird back in one piece. I know he's been successful. That'll be my glove then. So, enthusiastic little fellas. As you can see, 
perfect um, part shot. It's just above the uh, just above the chest in, in the crop area. And when you're shooting pigeons inside, it's always best to go for something which has got a good sized target area. Obviously, the best shot is a head or a neck shot. But by the time you get through the feathers, the neck is actually very small. You know, the head bobbing around all the time. You might not get a clean shot. And you might hit the building. Uh, luckily for me, uh, this thing, as you saw, it dropped straight away. It died straight away. And I've got all these helpful retrievers to, to help me pick my birds. So, come on then, guys. So we've had a great day. We've knocked over 12, Mark's really happy, the air range have performed perfectly. We're gonna go back in a couple of weeks time and stay on top of them. Well, we're back next week. And if you are watching this on YouTube, don't hesitate to click the subscribe button that's somewhere outside of the screen there. Or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can buy our DVDs. Or click to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, scroll down to the bottom of the screen where you'll find the constant contact box, pop your email address in there, and we will spam you. This has been Field Sports Britain. Sports Britain.